Welcome to worship for Sunday, July 26. I'm here with um, Jackie Hull, our media specialist in a small, socially, physically distant congregation. Uh, Diane Hiddleston uh, pre-recorded the music uh, last week with our organist, Jeff Burke, and so that will be on the on online service. Those of you who are here in person will be subjected to me singing a little bit. So uh, anyway, we'll start out with the call to worship, uh, just a few verses, the first five verses of Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. So that was, I, that was talking about God's miracles and wonders. I'm wondering if there's any, any miracles that God has done in your life or something that you know that God worked in your life. And that if, if that, something like that comes to mind, that is something that you should share with other people to encourage them in their faith. At this time, Diane Hiddleston will sing When Morning Gilds the Skies, number 185. lesson for today is taken from Genesis chapter 29 verses 15 through 28. And this is the story of, uh, continuing story of Jacob. He has, he has fled and uh, last week we, uh, we, we 
we had the story of Jacob and the ladder to heaven. Remember, he was on his way out, out of town fleeing his, his brother Esau. And now he's gotten to his, his uncle's house in, uh, where he was going. And the, the story picks up there. After Jacob had stayed with him for a whole month, Laban, Jacob's uncle, said to him, Just because you are a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed to him like only a few days because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to lie with her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. But when evening came, he took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and Jacob lay with her. And Laban gave his servant girl Zilpah to his daughter as her maidservant. When morning came, there was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? In other words, Jacob wakes up, he's with the wrong woman. He didn't even know it. Now, why, why is this? How is this possible? Well, I mean, he could have been drunk too much wine at the wedding party. She could have been veiled. He, I mean, it was dark, all, but you'd think, you'd think that he know, well, no, he didn't know. So he wakes up, wrong sister in bed with him. This is what Laban says. It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also in return for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with Leah, and then, Le and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant girl Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maidservant. Jacob lay with Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. Now that's one of those Bible stories that makes you kind of go, hmm, what's going on here? Here you've got Jacob, the deceiver, you know, who had deceived his, his brother, brother, Jake, brother Esau out of his father's deathbed blessing, remember that, and here he is being deceived by his uncle Laban and, of course, by, by Leah. She was in on it. She didn't say, no, I won't go. She, well, she may not have had a choice. We don't know, but she was there, and so the, between the two of them, uh, he was deceived. Is this perhaps divine justice as, at work? Jacob the deceiver being deceived? The Bible doesn't say anything about that, but it makes, uh, it makes you wonder. You know, one of the important things to remember when you're reading the Bible is that not everything that you read about people doing in the Bible is either morally or ethically right. Sometimes it's just what they did, and sometimes it was blatantly wrong. Polygamy was, was not God's original tension, intention for marriage. We, we see God's original intention for marriage in Genesis chapter 2 with the, the Adam and Eve story, the one man and one woman. And, but, but here you have uh, already an early introduction of, well, of, of polygamy, of more than one wife, as, as Jacob gets the wrong wife, and then after seven years of waiting, which is uh, amazing, in this day and age you read about 
about, about uh, and, and hear about things happening much quicker, uh, way before marriage, let alone waiting seven years to get married and, and to have, uh, have intimate relations. So that's another thing that's, that's totally, that, 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 that is you know, foreign to our culture, but not to biblical culture and, and biblical ethics. But anyway, as far as biblical ethics go, it, was, we, it is important to note that later God did give Moses a law that forbade this kind of, of, of thing happening. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 18 reads like this. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. So that would have forbidden what happened. I mean, he, he, Jacob was given, given uh, Leah first and then Rachel as a rival, right, rival wife. Can you imagine the, the sisterly relations between the two? And if you read farther in Genesis, you'll, you'll read, it was not good. Um, I can't imagine uh, having to be in that kind of a, a relationship. But uh, as I said, um, that's, that's one of the examples where Things in the Bible are, 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 people aren't always acting as they should be or as God would want them to act. I turn now to about five parables for our New Testament lesson, and they are taken from Matthew chapter 13 and uh, several, several verses in there. And these are parables that, that Jesus taught and that they were all on the subject of the kingdom of God. Actually, it's 31, 31 through 33 to start. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. And then two more parables, actually three more parables. Picking up with verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. And then our final parable for this time, starting at verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here ends these readings from the gospel according to Matthew. So we, have, we started out with the parable of the mustard seed, which, which I think really speaks to the fact that the kingdom of heaven, which, which we, is, is the same as saying kingdom of God. Matthew didn't like to use the name of God, so he'll have kingdom of heaven instead of kingdom of God, where the other gospels will talk about the kingdom of God. So the, the mustard seed, that little tiny seed, talks about how the kingdom of God has small beginnings and began with Jesus preaching and teaching and his, his small band of disciples of 12 people. That's very small beginnings, 
but has grown very large and includes now very many people from all the ages, from like 2,000 years ago down to now, or up to now, I should say, so that millions upon millions of people are now in the kingdom of God, included as members of God's family. Then we have the next, uh, the next parable that, it, that was talked, where, where Jesus compared the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven to yeast. I don't know how many of you are bakers. Um, I've never, my mother used to be a baker and make, bake, make bread from scratch. Um, me, the, as the, all, all that I get to do is, all that I do, never having done that, is throw a, a teaspoon of yeast in the bread machine maker and then throw some flour and other things on top of it. So that, that's about as easy a, as it gets. But Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to, to yeast. It was said it was like yeast mixed into flour. You see, like yeast, the kingdom of God is a transformative agent. It, is, it has small and seemingly insignificant beginnings, but then it can dramatically transform everyone who comes in intimate contact with it. So, for example, if we are, become part of God's kingdom, or the, or the realm of God, through accepting the, the gospel of salvation by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, and his sacrificial death on the cross for us, then our hearts and our lives can be changed by the incredible and the invisible working of the Holy Spirit in us. However, that should in turn result in visible changes in our lives as evidence of the invisible changes inside of us. And that's like yeast, the yeast that, that changes the, the invisible inner chemistry of the mixture of flour and other ingredients, but then also has a dramatic and visible effect on the size and shape of the dough, the bread dough that results from mixing the yeast with flour and other ingredients. Of course, if you've ever made, made bread and had it not rise, you'll know that that yeast has to be alive. Uh, it has to ha be alive to produce results. Active yeast causes the bread to rise and to expand and, and sometimes more than double in size, depending on what you're making, where dead yeast won't have any effect. You'll have a, a very uh, dense loaf and, and not very good tasting if you've, if you've ever had that happen to you. In a somewhat similar way, when our faith in God and his son Jesus Christ is living and vital, then people should be able, to make, be able to make changes in how we live and behave. And we, in turn, should be able to change, be change agents in our own culture, in our own society, in our own world. In fact, as you may know, the mission statement of the United Methodist Church is this, to make disciples for the transformation of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ invites us to be co-workers with him in expanding the kingdom of God. And, and he also invites us to be co- so that in doing that, in expanding the kingdom of God so that more of God's love and justice will become evident in the world. Jesus also commands us to to help to bring more and more people into a saving faith and knowledge of him as their Savior and Lord. In other words, to, to invite others to become part of the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. In addition, I think that part of the lesson of this parable of the yeast and the flour is, th is that God himself is working in powerful, yet sometimes imperceptible at first ways to increase his kingdom. Part of our job as Christians, as followers of his son Jesus Christ, is to notice those ways in which God is working, to celebrate them, and to work alongside others of God's people to multiply and magnify the kingdom of God here on earth so that one day 
it will grow to its full size and glory as in the heavenly realms. And God will bring that, it's up to God to bring that full growth in. It's not up to us, but we are co-workers with God. So in this meantime, before the kingdom comes in all of its fullness, what is God calling you and me to do? How is God calling us to be change agents in these challenging times? How is God calling us to try and transform our lives and our culture for, the, for God and the good? I turn now to the next parable where, where Jesus talked about how the kingdom of God was, was like a treasure that was hidden in a field and a a pearl of great price. If you remember, just a few minutes back, in both cases, the man in the parable was searching for something of great value, and he found it. In each case, after finding something of great value, he sold everything that he had, everything that he had to, to purchase the field that had the hidden treasure in it, or to purchase the pearl of great price. He, it says he, he went all out and sold everything. I think that in those parables, those were Jesus' ways of saying that being part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is of inestimable value. It's worth everything. It's worth every sacrifice at any price. It is being part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is something that we should value above all, above everything else. Being part of the kingdom of God, part of God's family, both here and now and into eternity, is the biggest treasure that we can possibly have in our lives. I think that's what nothing what Jesus is trying to say that that nothing is more essential not even our physical life not even our closest relationships being included in God's people in the kingdom of God is is the treasure beyond all treasures that's what I think geez, the point that Jesus is making in those two parables about the kingdom the pearl of of great price and the, the hidden treasure that the man sold everything for. And why is this treasure you know, worth everything else? Well, I think that that final parable that I read from Matthew 13 speaks to why, speak, speaks somewhat to why being part of the kingdom of God, part of God's people and, and realm is of the utmost important. And that's because there is that judgment day to come. You're probably all familiar with Dr. Seuss's book, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Even if you, you know, even if you, if you, you know, have, don't have children of your own, you may have read it to some child or heard of it. I mean, it's such a, a, a popular book um, and that, uh, for, for children. And, and this parable, but this parable of good fish and bad fish that I read to you from Matthew Church, chapter 13, isn't that kind of friendly tale, is it? But it does seek to teach us a lesson, just as Dr. Seuss's books were written to both entertain and to teach children, and, and I think adults as well, some lessons. Christ's lesson in, 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 talk, in, in, this, in the parable about, about the sorting of the bad fish and the good fish was a very serious warning to us that if we don't want to be discarded like bad fish are by fishermen at the end of a day's catch and meet a much worse end than they do, then we need to pay attention. Remember, Jesus is what Jesus said. He said, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, the, the bad news is that because we 
have all sinned and gone astray and done things our way rather than God's way, that in God's eyes, we are all bad fish. We, therefore, the good news then is, is you know, that, that's the bad news, that we, but, but there's hope from the gospel. And that is that we all need Christ's grace and forgiveness to make us to be seen as righteous in God's eyes. In other words, to be seen by God as good fish, not bad fish. And we all need Jesus to, as our Savior to give us his righteousness by paying the price for our sins on the cross. So that, that and, and, and by placing our faith in him, we become included in God's kingdom. And these, so that's a way in which we become good fish in God's eyes, even though sometimes the way we act is pretty rotten. I don't know if you, if, if you can relate to that, but sometimes we don't act like we should. And, and so we need Christ's righteousness to be applied to us for, for Jesus to say, yes, his sins are all forgiven. Her sins are all forgiven, Father, because they have placed their faith and trust in me as their Lord and Savior. I think all of these parables, all together, all five, invite us to a serious examination of our life's priorities. They invite us to ask ourselves if we are pursuing God and his kingdom through a living faith in Jesus Christ and an active pursuit of, of and choosing to do good rather than evil in our lives and in the world, or if we are chasing lesser things, if we are focusing on things that won't last, things of lesser value, things that actually might even be corrupting us and leading us away from the true treasure that is found in and with God himself. In fact, the true treasure is God himself and the Son, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, with whom we can expect to spend eternity if we place our faith and trust in Christ and keep on keeping on in the faith, no matter what, following Jesus through good times and through bad, as our leader and our Lord. Amen. At this time, Diane Hiddleston will sing for us, Take My Life, and let it be. Number 399. Behold, take 
be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be At this time, we, I would, uh, we'll, I'd like to join our hearts in prayer as we take our joys and concerns to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, I give you thanks for all those who are gathered here and for all those who will be listening online to our worship. May your spirit be with us all as we go f- forth into our daily, back into our daily lives. Lord, we pray in this time of so much sickness, we pray for those who are sick from COVID and from all sorts of other illnesses, for those who are injured, for those who are suffering the aches and pains of of old age, for all those who are suffering physically and mentally, And emotionally, we pray for your healing. We know that you are a great physician. And we pray for miracles, Lord, and we pray for healing for all those who come to mind. We lift up not only those of our own congregation, but all those around the world. We also pray, Lord, for all those who are struggling with addictions, whether it's to drugs or alcohol or nicotine or other less than life-giving behaviors and we pray lord for you to free them because we you know we know that you have come to set the captives free and way too many people are in bondage to to things that are less than life-giving and lord so we pray for them for them and their for their families for healing and for for health and liberation lord we pray for all those who are struggling financially those who are unemployed and underemployed or underpaid, for those who are in danger of of losing their home or apartment, and for those who are already homeless, for those who are hungry or in danger of becoming so, for those who are refugees having fled violence in their own nation or, 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 or extreme poverty to look for a better life elsewhere. We pray, Lord, for the leaders of all, this, all the nations, including our own, that you would guide them by divine wisdom in the ways of truth and justice and righteousness. We pray for peace in our nation and around the world. We pray for protection for those who, who will protest peacefully as our democracy allows and our constitution allows. And we pray, Lord, that we pray for peace and justice to prevail in this nation in this troubled times. We lift up these and other concerns to you as your people, knowing that you will hear them as our gracious Father. For we, our Lord Jesus Christ has told us that we can pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, comfort, and keep you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere everywhere you may go. Amen. Oh, <laughs>
See? 